Hi. If you are just starting or want to start collecting retro consoles, you have come to the right video. Having collected about 20 different game systems over the course of the past 4 to 5 years now, I have some thoughts and suggestions for those who want to start or are already on their retro collecting journey. I'll be sharing insights that I wish I had before diving into this hobby. If you find yourself feeling a bit lost while watching this video, feel free to leave any questions and comments. And now, let's get started. This might seem obvious, you get the cheapest one, right? However, there are numerous factors to consider, and sometimes it can get a bit more tricky. Here's a checklist that I would like to recommend researching. Video output. Let's say for an example you want to purchase a GameCube. Do you know that there are two revisions of the same console? One is with digital AV output and one is without. If you want to get the best picture quality available on GameCube, you'd have to get one with the digital AV port. Also, it's worth noting that with GameCube, NTSC consoles support S-Video output, and PAL consoles support RGB's CART output. Region locks. Figure out which region games you'd like to play, and if you want to play out of region games, research if you can mod your console to do so. Modifying an original Xbox to play games from different regions is relatively straightforward. While modding for an example a PAL Nintendo 64 to play NTSC games is practically impossible. Compatibility with games and accessories. Were you aware that certain PlayStation 2 games are incompatible or experience issues when used with later revisions of PS2 consoles? or that there were released Wii consoles without GameCube ports. These are the kind of details to be mindful of. Modding potential When it comes to something like a PlayStation 2, you're dealing with three major versions of the same console. But that's not all. Each model had multiple revisions. For example, did you know that some, but not all, PlayStation 2 Slims can have IDE hard drive connection restored with soldering? This is just the one example of how these hardware revisions can differ. Reliability There are some console revisions that are known to be more reliable than others. The best example of this that comes to my mind is a PS3 FAT with hardware backwards compatibility. These consoles are known to be very unreliable. These are a few of the kind of things I'd recommend for you to consider while shopping for a console for yourself. Check console buying guides, consult forums, and visit websites like RetroRGB.com. Do a little bit of research to avoid any disappointments in wasting your money when that could have been avoided. So, the most popular cables that you can get for your console are the composite cables. But at a later point, if you want to upgrade image output of your console, you can pick up either S-Video, Component or RGB's card cables. If your console doesn't natively support HDMI, RGB and Component cables, that is excluding any HDMI console mods, will offer the best image quality. Don't overlook S-Video either, especially if you're aiming for improved picture quality with consoles like the Nintendo 64. It provides a significant upgrade without needing console modifications. Websites like AliExpress and eBay are flooded with cheap video cables, so you get the cheapest one and call it done? Not quite. When buying cables for your old consoles, you must understand that analog video signals are prone to interference. The higher the quality of the video cable, the less interference you'll face. So what about these inexpensive HDMI adapters? The majority of them don't quite hit the mark when it comes to quality. 
These adapters rely on converters or upscalers that are not really made for gaming, but majority of them are primarily geared towards general video content, neglecting factors like latency and console output resolutions. This can result in noticeable lag and unintended video artifacts. There are high quality HDMI adapters out there. Just take your time to dig into the options, read up on reviews and compare. Here's some of the cables I can recommend. OEM cables. Opting for original cables from the console manufacturer is usually a solid bet. These cables for the most part are very well made. However, keep in mind that the downside is the cost. Anything beyond a basic composite cable from the console's heyday is likely to come with a hefty price tag. Since they weren't as widely adopted during the console's peak, they become somewhat of a rarity in today's market, driving up the prices. HD Retrovision Their component cables are among the best, boasting OEM-like quality. I can highly recommend them. Retro Gaming Cables They offer quite a selection of handmade cables that are of great quality. I have a quite few of these and I can say with certainty they know how to make proper cables. Depending on your knowledge of retro consoles, you might or might not have heard about these things. If you have an old CRT TV and plan to use it with your retro consoles, that's an excellent choice. However, if you intend to connect these old consoles to a newer TV, an upscaler can be quite handy. Modern TVs often struggle with older video standards. By using your modern TV's video inputs with your old consoles, you might encounter increased latency, video artifacts, or you might even get no display output on your TV. In fact, my TV doesn't even have any legacy video inputs. So, what's a video upscaler? In this scenario, a video upscaler is a device that takes your old analog video signals and converts them to a more modern, compatible video output. A high-quality upscaler minimizes lag, ensures the video output is compatible with modern TVs and in some cases becomes the essential solution to connect your old consoles to a new TV. There are many options on the market. Here's some that I have and I can highly recommend. OSSC. This is one of the most popular options, and I got a whole lot of mileage out of it. It's pricey, but it's totally worth it if you are thinking about collecting a lot of consoles. Mistake I've made when first starting out was that I had purchased a lot of cheap HDMI converters. In retrospect, with the knowledge I have currently, I would have purchased OSSC from the beginning. Quality pays off in the long run. RetroTink 2X Pro. Another great choice, this one's a whole lot simpler than OSSC, and if tinkering around with a bunch of settings doesn't sound like fun time for you, I'd consider this instead of an OSSC. RetroTink 5X I can't recommend it enough, but I'd call it an overkill for most people. If money is no issue for you, this upscaler will do an amazing job. There is a vast array of upscalers out there that I haven't personally tried. So I recommend doing your own research online. They come with various inputs, output resolutions and features. It's important to consider your specific needs and preferences to find what aligns best with your use case. Back in the day, if you lived in Europe, the standard video signal was 50 Hz. That means games had to be output at 50 frames per second. Since US and Japan used a variation of NTSC standard, their consoles output 60 frames per second. What this means is that games usually had to be optimized for their region, and while some good conversions were released for PAL regions, it's worth noting that not all of them were this way. For this reason, Sonic 1 on PAL Mega Drive was running slower than in other regions, and for example Ocarina of Time for the PAL Nintendo 64 was running at 17 frames per second as opposed to NTSC version which ran at 20. 
most modern TVs have no issues displaying either signal, but it's worth taking into consideration when choosing which region console you're buying. Consoles like the original Xbox can be modified to output either NTSC or PAL signal with relative ease. On the other hand, consoles like the Nintendo 64 are pretty much stuck with no way of changing the console's output signal. Do a bit of research and check which consoles can be modified and which cannot. While this will depend on your personal wants and availability, my personal recommendation is to pursue NTSC consoles whenever possible, either by modifying them or by importing them from other countries. Starting from 7th generation of consoles like Xbox 360 or PlayStation 3, this doesn't really matter, since both of these consoles can output 60Hz with no problems. When buying old consoles, you must understand that they will not always be in perfectly mint condition, and even if they were perfectly at first, expect to do some cleaning at the very least later down the line. Sticky or stuck buttons, dirty AV or cartridge ports are part of this hobby. You might need to get comfortable with opening your consoles and controllers. Getting a screwdriver set with most common console screw tips is a must, I personally use this iFixit kit and I rarely need any other tools to open my consoles. Expect to buy isopropyl alcohol, q-tips and cotton pads as well. Contact cleaners can work great too. If you're knowledgeable enough with electronics repair, buying and repairing broken consoles can give you some cost savings. There are some great videos out there on console repair. If you're getting serious about this hobby, learning to solder can be quite helpful. Replacing cartridge batteries, capacitors might come up at one point. When starting to learn soldering, I have two major suggestions. First, get a decent iron. Cheap irons are hard to work with and can lead you to think that soldering is not for you. I've made this mistake before, don't make the same one. For not that much money, you can get something like this. It will work better than any of those 10 euro soldering irons. It's only about 50 euros and it was totally worth my investment. And second, learn about using flux and desoldering braid. These two tools are essential to get decent results. It might be fairly obvious for some, but I did make the mistake of not using flux when starting out. When doing retro game console collecting, sooner or later you might come across retrobriting. So what's retrobriting? Retrobriting is a way to de-yellow plastic with chemicals. While many people stand by this method, I find it quite inconsistent and not a magic silver bullet. When you're browsing eBay or Facebook Marketplace and you see a yellowed console, don't assume it will be a great target for retrobriting. I tried retrobriting a Dreamcast and I got splotchy results. Some consoles, after they have been yellowed, become very brittle and retrobrite does nothing to improve their durability. It's a fun project to do, but use caution and don't assume that you will get great results. I'd recommend buying a console in a condition that you will be happy with and if any super cheap console that's yellowed comes by, you might as well do it for fun. While this will vary wildly, I have a cautionary tale to tell you. After botching my Dreamcast Retrobrite, I bought a replacement shell from AliExpress, but soon I found out that it's quite inconsistent in its quality. While it looked great and felt somewhat decent, its power button was getting stuck all the time, and after trying all kinds of hacks to fix it, I just gave up and switched back to the original shell. Also, I have this modded GBA, and these are all the replacement parts I won't be using. Why? Because all these transparent replacement shells are so easily damaged it's not even worth it. Screw posts can be broken easily and you don't even have to use that much force to damage one while assembling. And what's wrong with the buttons? They are all terrible. They need to be pushed much harder and still produce missing inputs. In the end I just opted to use this fully opaque shell 
It's much sturdier than the transparent ones and I kept the original buttons. They feel so much better to use. So what I'm trying to say is that whenever possible use original parts. Even if they visually look subpar, they are most likely of a much better quality. Of course I haven't tried all options and apparently replacement shells sold by 8-bit mods and similar vendors are of a much better quality than those that can be bought on AliExpress. In any case, this is what my experience has been and I hope if you ever buy replacement parts you have better luck than me. So, you like using original hardware, but you also like modern wireless controllers? I have all of these to bring to your attention. These are controller adapters that can use modern wireless gamepads. How about original Xbox with Xbox Series controller? Maybe you'd like to play Dreamcast with a wireless GameCube controller. There are many options out there, and with some console controllers getting more expensive and harder to find, they can sometimes provide a cheaper alternative to the real deal. While I do enjoy using original controllers most of the time, these are great to have. I can highly recommend brands like Brook, 8-Bit Doe and Mayflash. I have a, quite a collection of their adapters and they have been great. While far from a requirement for enjoying old consoles, ODEs and flashcards shouldn't be overlooked. With old games being harder to find and getting more expensive, this opens a way to try new games and preserve your original copies. An ODE or an optical drive emulator is what you can use to replace consoles disk drive and load games from SD cards. Flash cartridges work in a similar way, but you don't have to do any modifications to your console. And you can use one cartridge with an SD card to play all your games. As an added bonus, ODEs and flashcards open up the possibility of playing fan translations and homebrew games. I still enjoy buying original games, but there is no way I'm going to invest in games that cost more than current gen consoles. I think going forward with old games not being available anymore, this will be more of a necessity, and for me it already is. With retro gaming getting more expensive than ever, more scams show up on eBay. Fake cartridges are not a rarity. I advise you to research ways to tell if the cartridge you're looking at is a fake. Also, if you care about the visual condition of consoles, try to find out if the listing you're looking at sells the same console as in the picture. Many listings sell multiple consoles with the same image. This means you never know exactly what you're getting. Sometimes this can be determined if the listing has more than one console available. Sometimes it's sneakier and you must search description if there is a mention that the console is the same one as pictured. If not sure, contact the seller. Starting a retro console collection can be a rewarding experience. There are so many things to talk about that I didn't mention, but I hope that I did provide some useful information. Thank you for sticking till the end. And I hopefully see you in next one.